Uh, so before we start, I just want to make a quick announcement to everyone that's on the Zoom call right now. Um, for everyone to make sure they have their webcams uh, so on, just so you know, start, uh, one security reasons, but also on the Zoom call um, right now. Give it that community um, feel. Everyone um, we're trying to make sure they have their webcams uh, on. Just so like, start, uh, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make sure they have their webcams on. Just so you know, one security reasons, but also can give it that community feel. Everyone trying to make his family, his companions, and all those who follow his way until the day of judgment. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us amongst him. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make this beneficial for us. We ask Allah Ta'ala to guide us and to allow us and give us tawfiq and hidayah to practice that which we, we, um, we, which we teach. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to facilitate for us and protect us and guide us. I mean, so alhamdulillah, I'm always happy to be with my uh, young YM brothers, mashallah. Um, uh, Subhanallah, Sunday Sunday night, nine o'clock, going strong. Is this your guys' normal timing to get together, typically? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, we started up the series, so we decided uh, we didn't want to interfere with neighbor net time, so we decided to just go with nine o'clock, eight thirty, nine o'clock, depending on the time zone of the speaker on Sundays. Nice, mashallah. And we're at the same time, right? Time zone, central zone is the same. Yes, sir. Allah, mashallah. Allah accept it from you, brothers, mashallah. So I, I've been um, tasked with the responsibility of. Um, Reminding myself and you all, my dear brothers, um, about, uh, you know, the concept of shahwat or hawa. Um, does anyone know what that term, what those terms mean? Shahwat or hawa? What that word, what that term means? Everyone's muted. Um, so, so for those, so whenever you ask a rhetorical question or just the questions in general, you guys can go ahead and drop in your answers in the chat. We'll go ahead and read them out. Um, so we have one of them saying desires. Anyone yes. else? I mean, that's pretty much it. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um, in Surah Naziat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى And really this is the theme, this is the ayah that I want us all to kind of highlight and to remember this verse uh, from the, the 30th uh, Safara, 30th, 30th Juz of the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us the recipe Subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, he gives us the recipe that is used for those who um, inherit the hellfire and those who inherit paradise. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us on this earth as a test. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for the purpose of ubudiyah, of worship of Allah, of knowing Allah, coming to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by coming to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and serving him, we, inshallah, with Allah's guidance and with our effort, we have the capability of obtaining paradise or obtaining hellfire based on our the, the, the results of the reality of this world. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, he says, listen, I'm, I, I created you to worship me. I put you on earth. I put you in this dunya as a test. And I'm giving you guidance in order for, the, in order for you to be able to pass this te test success, successfully. And in the hidayah, in the revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us um, the, you know, in, in the entire Quran in Hidayah, but there are certain ayat of Quran that kind of take the entire Hidayah of the Quran and put it into these succinct um, reminders for us to remember. And one of these ayat is in, in this surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ طَغَى وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا فَإِنَّ الْجَحِيمَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Those, the human being who rebels against Allah. And this is a real, like, uh, this is a real... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, this is a label that we should all be very afraid of that you are literally in the state of rebellion against Allah 
How are we in the, how is a human being in the state of rebellion? The one who rebels against Allah. How do they rebel against Allah? They prefer the dunya, the this world that they live in. They prefer the luxuries and the desires and the experiences of this world to the hereafter or to the obedience of Allah or to the servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of their preference to the desires of this world over the obedience and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the desire for the hereafter, because of that, they're in a state of rebellion. And because of them being in a state of rebellion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, their destination will be the hellfire. In the jahima hi al ma'wa. Jahim, the hellfire will be their final abode. But then Allah, so that is a, in a very succinct form, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, listen, this is the reason why people get to the hellfire. They prefer this life, the desires of this life over the hereafter or over the love and thankfulness to Allah and obedience. And, and that is demonstrated in the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then Allah ta'ala says, listen, the opposite is also true. And as for those who feared the day they will stand in front of their Lord, maqam Rabbi, meaning the day the, 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 the maqam is the, the, the place of standing. It's the place in which you'll stand in front of your Lord. All right, so this is the day of judgment. So uh, and so as for the one who fears the day they will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result of that fear for the day of standing in front of Allah, they fight themselves. They curtail the desires. They prevent their nafs from its desires. As a result of that, they will get jannah. Their final abode, their final destination will be Jannah. So this is really, this set of ayat, these set of ayat are really the ayat that we really want to lay down as a foundation for today's discussion. Okay, that we're placed in this earth with, as a test by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will we be obedient to Allah or will we be disobedient or rebellious to Allah? Those who are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will get Jannah. Those who are rebellious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will get the hellfire. So what are the what is the description, the fundamental overall description of the people of hellfire? That they give preference to the desires of this world to the obedience of Allah. And what is the fundamental characteristic of the people of Jannah, of paradise? Is that they have a fear of, of the standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the accountability on the day of judgment. And as a result of that, they fight their nafs. They prevent their nafs from um, desires that are um, harmful desires, that are prohibited desires. And as a result of that, they get paradise. So this is really the foundation of today's discussion. Why is it so important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has highlighted this character, this fundamental characteristic of the people of paradise? Can anyone think about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said the fundamental characteristic of the people of paradise is that they prevent themselves from prohibited desires? Let's see what the chat has to say. Arafai, could you please uh, repeat the question for us one more time? Yeah, so as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has highlighted this characteristic, fundamental characteristic, as the key characteristic for obtaining paradise? That they prevent themselves from prohibited desires. Let's see, we got an answer. It is uh, because it is something that makes us stand out from all other people. Um, we uh, consciously control our desires. Um, 
And another answer is it was the reason Adam got thrown, Adam Alaysan got thrown out of Jannah. Hmm. Let's see. Because the nuf is a controlling variable. Well, that's a nice, that sounds sophisticated, mashallah. Yeah. So that, that's Dallas for you. <laughs> sounds like some type of chemistry equation discussion or something. <laughs> so this is this is exactly it. Now I'm gonna hold, I'm not gonna answer that question right away. Instead, I want to highlight another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that is very famous. Many of us have probably heard it before, and it's going to really take this message home, inshallah. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, alhamdulillah, we're blessed to be in these days of the Hijjah, right? And we ask Allah Ta'ala to um, allow us to take advantage of these days of the Hijjah. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to allow us to, to see the day of Arafah. We ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive us and to forgive the Ummah in entirety and allow us to celebrate the days of Eid. So, but we know in the month of Ramadan, we, all, we almost always hear these in the khutbahs, etc. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says when the, when, when, when the month of Ramadan comes, فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابِ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِقَتْ أَبْوَابِ الْجَهَنَّمِ وَصُفِضَتْ الشَّيَاطِينَ So there are three things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says happens in the month of Ramadan. Number one is that the doors of paradise are opened. And the uh, doors of hellfire are closed. And here's the key. I want to focus on this last part. And the shayateen are chained. They're incapacitated. Actually, the better term is that the shayateen are incapacitated. Okay, how is this hadith commonly understood? And, and this is one of the opinions of, of looking at, and this is the more common opinion of looking at this hadith. How do we understand, what does it mean that the shayateen are locked up? What does that mean in the month of Ramadan? Let's see what the chat has to say. Uh, there we got one answer saying that they cannot whisper into your heart. Yeah, they can't whisper into your heart. Okay. I mean, the temptations aren't necessarily there. Um, the that they're unable to lead you to your nafs to do anything. Um, yep. it gives you the chance to mute distractions and work on your own nafs. Okay. Since they're easy to stay away from. Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. All these things are excellent. All right. This is the common way that we, it means that we're not be able to influence you. Okay. This is... So I really want you guys to think about this. So there's one way to look at this hadith. The one way we look at this hadith, and this is the way that we're commonly um, commonly taught this hadith, and it's and it's an acceptable opinion. And in, in fact, um, it's an opinion that is commonly taught and, and it's acceptable. But I I, I personally tend to gravitate to another opinion that I'm going to bring up bring up inshallah, um, as I found it to be quite profound and it's related to our topic today. The, the, the common understanding of this hadith is that Allah, when Allah said, when, when, when Ramadan comes, the doors of Jannah are open and the jo doors of Jahannam are closed and the shayateen are locked up. The common understanding of this hadith is that Allah, because we don't, the, 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 the way that the hadith is stated, there is no subject. We don't know who's doing the action. Right? This is called ism majhul or fil majhul. This is a passive verb, meaning we don't the subject is 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 not mentioned explicitly. So it, it's up to the, uh, the 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 scholars or up to the scholar to try to understand who is doing the action. So the question we we need to ask ourselves: We know that the doors of paradise are opened. We know that the doors of hellfire are closed, and we know that the shayatin are locked up. But who's doing the locking? Who's doing the opening? Who's doing the closing? The common understanding of this, and of course we know ultimately everything comes in Allah's power, right? Ultimately Allah is the one who does all of it, right? But the common understanding of this hadith is that Allah is the one who opens the door of paradise. And Allah is the one who opens the doors of hellfire. And Allah is the one who, who incapacitates the shayateen. And of course we know Allah Ta'ala, everything goes back to him in his power. We're not, that, is, it, that is understood, right? But... Um, Imam um, uh, Imam Aiz bin Abdul Salam, he wrote a book, it's called Maqasid al Som, The Objectives of Fasting. And he mentions this hadith and he gives his explanation of this hadith, which is slightly different, 
from the un understanding that you guys have all pretty much presented and many of us, this is how we, we, we learned it. And it is an acceptable opinion uh, within the ummah. He says, rather, wh why is it that the doors of paradise are opened? And why is it the doors of hellfire are closed? And why is it that the shayateen are incapacitated? Sufiullah to shayateen. He says, because the, it is because of the actions of the believers. It is the believers themselves and their actions that has such a profound metaphysical effect that their actions are constant. Because when you're in the month of Ramadan, you're constantly engaged in ibadah. Like the ummah as a whole is, is in an increased state of ibadah, of worship and righteousness and piety, right? And as a result of that increased state of righteousness and piety, you, we know that our, our actions are presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the, through the heavens. And so these actions are presented constantly through, to the heavens. So the doors of Jannah remain open because of the behavior of the, the ummah, of the, of the Muslimin. And similarly, because the Muslimin are more, because they are more prevented or they're more in a state of discipline in the month of Ramadan, typically as a whole, the actions of evil actions are withheld and therefore the doors of Jahannam are closed. And the shayateen, how are the shayateen incapacitated? And this is really what comes down to our topic today. The shayateen are incapacitated because of the effect of, of saum, the effect of fasting is such that it curtails the hawa. It curtails the nafs. It curtails the human desire. And because human desire is the tool that the shayateen use to get to influence the human being, because the ummah is in the state of saum, of fasting, they have curtailed their nafs. As a result of that, the shayateen tufidat. The shayateen are incapacitated. The shayateen are incapacitated, not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala necessarily actively incapacitates them, take them, takes them away. No, that's one opinion, of course. And that's perfectly acceptable. And it makes sense and it's acceptable. But for me, I find it more profound that it is the action of the believers that incapacitates the shayateen. Why do I find that so important and so profound? And how does it relate to what we're talking about today? Because what this does is it puts the control in your hands. It puts the control in my hands. We are in control of our fate. And we will be held accountable in the day of judgment for our own actions. The jinn, the shayateen, they have no influence upon us except how much we give them influence. How much influence we allow them to have. And the influence we allow them to have, we invite them to have influence upon us through our nafs, our desires, our shahawat. The more we curtail and discipline our desires, both halal and prohibited, of course, starting with the prohibited, the more we curtail our desires, the less influence the shayateen have. And so what this tells us is, of course, because of the blessing of the month of Ramadan and because of the, the, the tawfiq that Allah gives in the month of Ramadan, the ummah as a whole has, is in such a state of discipline that their nafs and their desires as a whole, of course, there's exceptions. We all struggle no matter what, even in the month of Ramadan. But as a whole, it is easier for us to curtail ourselves in the month of Ramadan. Because of that, the shayateen have less influence on us. What that teaches us, though, is that in the month when the month of Ramadan is over, we can continue to incapacitate the shayateen if we continue the methodology of discipline that we maintain in the month of Ramadan. And so, what this does is it take it allows us to take ownership of ourselves. And so, at the end of the day, the reality is this: that our ticket to Jannah is by curtailing our desires. Why? Because if we discipline our desires, if we discipline our hawa and our nafs, the shayateen have less influence on us. 
And as a result of that, we will continue to grow in piety and we'll continue to grow in righteousness and we'll continue to grow and, and, and our hearts will continue to expand. And so this is the fundamental point that I want to make when it comes to our shahwat, when it comes to our hawa, our desires, that the believer needs to be in a constant state of discipline. And so even if you look at the books of Islamic Tazkiya, right? If you look at the books of spirituality, the books of disciplining the heart and disciplining the soul. I like to use the word disciplining because purifying is beautiful. It sounds cool and everything. But really what it comes down to practically and actively is that this is disciplining. We are disciplining ourselves, right? And, you know, mashallah, I'm sure we got some young brothers here who are, mashallah, very like, you know, fitness conscious. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure you guys know who those guys are, right? The fitness conscious people, it's about discipline, right? You got to body build. You got to build. You have to kind of control your diet, to control your exercise. It's all about discipline. Even when it comes to school, when it comes to anything that we do, it comes down to discipline, right? Similarly, when it comes to our our, our desires. We had to discipline our desires. The beautiful thing about this religion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ Allah has not placed within this religion such restriction that it is difficult for us to practice this religion. Allah ta'ala created us with desire. Desire is not in and of itself an evil thing. It is uncontrolled desire. Undisciplined desire that is destructive. And this is what we need, to, we need to understand. Every single desire we have, the desire to eat, the desire to drink, the desire to socialize, the desire to be intimate, the desire, physical desire of intimacy, all of these desires, they, Allah Ta'ala created us with these desires and they are perfectly healthy desires. But Allah Ta'ala gives us the sharia, He gives us the guidance so that we can facilitate um, the we can we can um, facilitate um, uh, 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 um, um, facilitate the appetite in a healthy way, healthy for us physically, healthy for us mentally, healthy for us socially, and healthy for us spiritually. So when we look at the restrictions or when we look at the the boundaries that Allah Taala makes for our desires. He makes it in such a way because it is healthy for us. Not because he wants to just like, you know, to torment us or something of that nature. So when it comes to our hawa, it, there's boundaries, right? And we need to discipline ourselves to the, to the extent where our desires are not uncontrolled. Meaning we control our desires. They don't control us. And when, when we're able to discipline ourselves to such an extent, then inshallah we'll be successful in this world and the hereafter. And we'll have a healthy appetite. We'll have a healthy appetite, healthy ap appetite when it comes to our desires. And so what this comes down to is this. We have desires. It's not a dirty thing. These are things that Allah Ta'ala created us with. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala has given us healthy, healthy and pure means to, 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 to uh, fulfill those desires. And so when we talk about as young men, as we talk about desires, we're not talking about cutting ourselves off of desires altogether. No, it's disciplining those desires and, and turning towards means that are healthy for us. And one particular desire that, um, you know, we really need to think about, it's, 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 it's becoming more and more of a problem because of, we're in the age of the internet, right? We're in the age of, you know, 900 megabytes per second upload, download internet, right? This is not your uh, AOL, you know, wait 30 minutes before you sign on and then you can have an ASL, you can have some type of conversation on the chat, right? like, you know, instant messages, right? That, 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 those, my days, <laughs> those days are gone. You, my dear young brothers, are in even more challenging times because <clears throat> it is right at your, right in your, your, your the, you have access to whatever you want right in this handheld telephone computers are probably like not even, you probably don't even use computers anymore. It's your handheld telephone. You have Snapchat, you have Instagram, you have, I don't even know if you guys use Facebook anymore. You have TikTok. TikTok is probably worse than everything, everything out there because you're exposed to so much, right? And the reality is that it's all readily available for you. And you probably know your technology better than your parents. And the reality is that the one desire that I really wanted to kind of, 
you know, finalized my discussion with is that sexual desire. And I know this is a taboo topic, but let's just be real. You know, the, if the statistics are true, the reality is that the majority of us in this group right now have been exposed to pornography in some type of fashion. Okay. And some of us, and let's be real again, some of us actively participate in view, viewing of pornography. And then even more, some of us may be addicted to pornography. This is a reality that we have to face. And it's, 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 if, we don't, if, we're, if we're not real with ourselves about this, then we, and we just sweep it under the rug in the community. We're not going to be able to come to healthy solutions for us as individuals, as communities. Why is this important? You know, some people may feel that pornography is just, you know, it's a, it's a harmless, it's a harmless um, reality. You know, no one gets hurt, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's my privacy in my room, whatever the case may be. The reality, though, is that especially when it gets to the addictive level, and many times it gets to that state or it gets to that compulsive level, it affects relationships. It's going to affect your relationship with your future spouses. It affects your perception of intimacy, of what it means to be intimate with your wife. It affects um, your, for many of us, it, it definitely affects your spiritual state. It affects your mental state because a lot of times you, um, a lot of times you essentially get to this, this, this um, idea, you get to the state where um you're, you, you, you feel depressed. You feel like a hypocrite, right? Compared to, you know, you, you, especially if you're a young brother, NYM, for example, mashallah, you, you, Islam is important to you, right? And you kind of, and, you, and you, you understand what's right, what's wrong, and you want to do what's good, right? But then you're faced with these cha this challenge of pornography. You're faced with the challenge of this desire that is just constantly uh, coming, coming to you. And then you feel like a hypocrite. Is oh maybe you're a neighborhood coordinator or maybe you're a, you're an active member in the core team of YM or you're engaged in the community you're an MSA member whatever the case may be or you just you're 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 a good you're a good Muslim child and you're embarrassed in front of your family and you start to feel the sense of shame and that affects your mental state. So pornography is not just like a harmless thing. It it, it is very it is, it can, it can be very harmful uh, for an individual and we know especially it is harmful for us spiritually. At the end of the day, it is harmful for us spiritually. So it is something that we need to address. We need to come to some level of, um, you know, support for one another in the community to help those who want to get out of, um, you know, the addiction or the compulsiveness of pornography because it is harmful. And um, the, the thing that I want to really uh, discuss here when it comes to uh, pornography is number one, what I remember, as I said, this is a natural desire. It is a natural desire. The desire, that physical desire that you have, it is a natural one. Okay? And it's not one that Allah Ta'ala asks you to curtail off altogether. Allah Ta'ala is asking you to discipline it, and then you can fulfill that desire in a healthy manner with your wife. Okay? And so this means... Okay, you're like, Ada, if you're talking about marriage, and I'm like 14 years old, bro, like I have 10, 15 years before I can think about marriage. I understand that. I understand that reality. The, the, the thing is, the, the thing I can say about this is that we, one of the problems I think about marriage when it comes to young brothers is not the fact that they had to wait, oh, like, oh, we had to wait forever to get married. It's the fact that they're not preparing themselves early on at a younger age to get married earlier. Okay, there are challenges uh, for, for getting married at a young age, and we can talk about that another time. But one of the main things that I would advise you, my dear brothers, is that you should prepare yourself for marriage at a young age. What does that mean? What that means is you need to prepare yourself professionally. You can't get married typically, especially in our communities, if you're not able to, to take care of yourself and your spouse, and it is a right of your spouse to take care of them, take, uh, take care of shelter and, and, and sustenance, etc. So we need to prepare for ourselves professionally so that we can be ready for marriage. And a lot of times that comes down to education or it comes down to proper crafts or trade trades that we may learn from families or whatever. But you need to think about what can I do professionally where I can take care of myself and my family.
number one. Number two is mentally, psychologically. You need to prepare yourself. A lot of brothers, they're happy with just hanging out Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights, just hanging out till 12 in the morning, and they have no sense of responsibility. You need to build a sense of responsibility. You need to have you need to physically facilitate your maturation process, your psychological maturation process, so that you're capable of holding on a relationship with somebody else. And that means you cannot be selfish. Marriage is about compromise. Marriage is about being selfless. The more selfish we are as a people, the, the more damaging it will be for our relationships. So we need to prepare ourselves professionally. We need to prepare ourselves psychologically. And we need to prepare ourselves physically for marriage. And physically, that means getting yourself in a position uh, in life where you can hold your own. You are your own man. You're not completely dependent on your parents, both psychologically, financially, etc. But you're in a position where you can hold your own and make your own decisions. You need to be prepared to make your own decisions. So this is what we need to think about when it comes to marriage. Now, outside of marriage, preparing ourselves to get married at a younger age. As Muslims, we should be preparing ourselves to get married at a younger age. Um, and what that means is a whole other topic, okay? Uh, because it comes with its own precautions and discussions okay the second thing is when it comes to um pornography in and of itself there are some solutions in the community there are some resources in the community if you feel like it's a problem for you meaning you've tried stopping yourself from pornography but you can't stop you're feeling guilty is affecting your spiritual state. It's affecting your relationships. It's affecting your mood. It's affecting your quality of life. These are the things where you're like, I really need to stop this. And it's becoming unhealthy to me. We, that's pretty much all of us. If we feel we definitely affecting our spiritual life, then we need to engage these resources. One resource that is highly, it is highly um, uh, regarded is a website called Purify Your Gaze. Purify Your Gaze. I'll type it later when I have the opportunity to type in the chat. But that is um, basically is an anonymous online virtual uh, resource for those who are engaged in some type of illicit type of relationship or pornography, etc. It's an, it is one of those highly regarded resources in the community. Someone put it up here. So this is something that I really want you guys to look at if you're finding yourself in a state that you're like feeling emotionally unstable as a result of um, your por pornography um, addiction um, and, or, or, or compulsive pornography um, activity. It's something that you need to regard. Listen, I can sit here and tell you how haram it is to watch pornography. I can make you feel so guilty about watching pornography and make you like, oh, the hellfire is waiting for you, my dear brothers. I could do that, but that I honestly don't believe that has any impact because I, I know you know that it's wrong. I know you know that it is prohibited. I know you know that it feels impure and it is impure. I know you know all these things, but you still probably feel compelled to do it. So this is not my purpose as your older brother to tell you how haram this is and how prohibited it is. That means nothing. We need to get to the root of the problem. Why is it that I can't stop myself from it? And it comes down to, you know, seeking out resources in the community to obtain help, um, elder brothers, etc., and so on and so forth, to obtain uh, help. You can't do it alone. And the last thing I'll say, inshallah, before we open it up to discussion, is that, listen, the, the worst thing we can do is commit a sin and become... So it becomes so watered down to us that we don't even feel guilty about it anymore. So you just keep doing it, doing it. In the beginning, you're, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're shameful. And then you're just like, whatever, it's a part of my life now. And then you continue to do it without shame, without guilt. And it's it, now that sin that may, may have been a minor sin becomes a major sin because it's something that you've become desensitized. Uh, the, the process I'm said, Toba to Nedem. Toba, repentance is feeling, feeling sorry, feeling guilty for your act. The moment that guilt disappears, that is when you are in a very unhealthy spiritual state. So whenever you, even if you are, 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 are 
are committing any sin, and especially this sin, every single day, never go to bed just accepting it. Make ghusl, make wudu, pray two rakat and ask Allah for forgiveness. And say, Allah, I'm going to try my best not to do it again tomorrow. And wake up in the morning thinking, I will try my best not to do it today. And if you fall into it, khair. Do the same process. Make ghusl. Pray to rakat. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Make the intention. Do not die in a state of sin and acceptance of sin. Die in a state of pure intention that you are going to do good. And so we, the Prophet says, if you do an evil act, follow it up with a good act. And that evil act will disappear. And that's true even with pornography addiction. You commit this sin, it feels shameful, you feel embarrassed, you would hide it from anyone. Okay, you did it. Okay, whatever. Khair, go. Make, make, khusr. make dua to Allah for forgiveness. Make the intention that you won't do it again tomorrow. Even if you fall into it, you're going to do it again. Always follow up sin with an act of good. Always do that. Never allow sin to be built up upon one another without some type of tawbah. May Allah Ta'ala guide us and facilitate for us. So I'll open it up for questions or comments and reflections. Sakala, <clears throat> khair for that. Um, I do have a couple questions lined up um, from the Q&A uh, form we released, um, I think like about like last week. Um, so the first one was, if you are in a never-ending cycle, um, despite trying to quit for a few years now, so you're having a very hard time quitting, uh, and you and your cycle is just, you know, you commit the act, you make toba, and then you just keep going in that circle, you know, what are some practical steps in your daily lives to try and overcome this porn addiction? So, um, so one of the things is seeking out a third party, all right? Mm -hmm. Seeking out a third party, a neutral somebody you trust or somebody uh, anonymous or neutral, the resources that I mentioned before, sometimes if we don't have the, the, the willpower ourselves, we need somebody to help facilitate that. There's cognitive behavioral techniques and stuff like that for any type of addictive or, or, or harmful behavior that we have. There are methodologies that we can use, inshallah, to, um, you know, to facilitate um, some level of change. And so if you don't, if you're doing this always on your own, and I understand this is a particular act that is hard to open up to somebody about, um, but this is the problem. <laughs> this is the problem with our communities. We have all these imams and we have all these youth coordinators and we don't have anyone to open up to like on an individual basis to get assistance with this. That's a problem, but that's a topic for another day. We need to seek out those resources, inshallah, try to seek out assistance. But when it comes to like this on, on your own, right? putting that aside, you know, make the intention every single morning, right? That you are not going to do it. One of the things that is probably helpful is avoiding being alone frequently, avoiding, um, avoiding things that may stimulate your desire. Um, like I said, social media, TikTok, Snapchat, things that like, you know, you may have half naked girls dancing and stuff like that. Okay. I understand you're you're engaging in conversations with your friends and you're just kind of it could be harmless it can appear harmless but for someone who has a problem that's not so harmless anymore right it's harmful for you and only you know that so avoiding things that may stimulate that desire avoiding being alone um if you again if you fall into it get back get back on track these are just some basic things I can give you. But really, at the end of the day, for real help, you need to go to people who are a, a specialists in that, inshallah. Agreed. Um, so then, so with that, right, when you're trying to, like, you know, get help and stuff like that, what happens before that? Like, how do you deal with the spiritual aspect where it's like, okay, I committed this act, you know, I'm disgusted with myself, um, and I, I feel like I'm not, I don't want to say, like, worthy enough, but the question specifically says, how do I deal with the feeling of hypocrisy and guilt after indulging in these type of habits? It discourages me from doing good deeds and ibadah and ridding myself of the habit. Um, so in overall, it just, it just keeps lowering my self-esteem. How, how, how does one deal with that issue? This is my core message today, guys. If you forget everything else, it's this. If falling into this act, sometimes the, um, the after effect is more harmful than the actual act itself. The act is spiritually damaging, right? But one of the reasons why it's spiritually damaging is because it's compounding. It's compounded. 
it's compounded with that that sense of hypocrisy afterwards and that sense of hypocrisy and shame and guilt and etc sometimes it can lead to depression if it's incessant is that it 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 will bring you down even more spiritually you may feel like completely trapped you may feel like you're not capable of changing you may feel like you're just a horrible person the fundamental message i have for us today is that you're not a horrible person this is probably something that a significant percentage of men and muslim men young and old deal with you're not alone first of all and you're not evil there are perfectly good people majority of uh, people who watch pornography are perfectly good righteous people but they this is something that they struggle with and so you're not alone you're not evil don't allow that sense of shame and, and guilt become debilitating for you it should be uplifting for you it should be like i do feel bad i'm not saying don't be guilty i'm saying you should feel guilty because if you're not guilty then it's then it's a problem but don't allow that guilt and that shame to pull you away from being with uh the righteous and and continue doing the good that you're doing inshallah so yeah uh good point um so another question that we've had with is that um like how do you go ahead so when it comes to this right you mentioned it a little bit earlier where it's like oh these desires can lead to thoughts and thoughts can lead to actions um and i remember you personally told me and a couple of the other guys in the who are watching today you know steps on how to keep yourself in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the day and how to establish that schedule so one of the questions that we asked was um what are daily practical steps for muslims who aren't that may who maybe aren't that far in their religious path yet to implement into their daily lives so that you know they're in a constant state of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so, you know, these desires and thoughts um, might not happen as often as it would be um, without this. Uh, very, uh, very profound. Uh, there's a statement in uh, American culture. It says, idle hands are the hands of the devil. And even though it's taken from American culture, it has prophetic wisdom in it, right? If you find yourself uh, idle, meaning idle hands are the hands of the devil, meaning if you're just, if you're not filling your day with purposeful action, then it is very easy for you to fall into evil, right? And so one of the things is first making a determination that I am going to try my best to make myself as busy as possible, not just for the sake of busyness, but with purpose. Um, so that, inshallah, I don't find myself, again, remember one of the first things I said is, or one of the last things I just said was that try not to be alone as much as you can, right? Um, so that means being engaged in, 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 in society, being engaged in activism, being engaged in, in various activities so that you're not alone uh, with yourself um, all the time. And if you are alone with yourself, it's because you're engaged in some type of purposeful action. And so what are those purposeful actions that we should be engaged in besides your regular, like having a good hobby? These are just practical things now, right? Having a good hobby, like having a hobby, like when you come home from school, you're not just watching TV, playing video games and, and social media, right? Like that, like if that's your daily schedule, every single day you come home from school, then yeah, you're probably going to fall into some type of idiocy or some type of problem or something's going to happen, right? Uh, and I say this as somebody who that was pretty much my life when I was in high school, right? I would just get home, play video games, right? And so, that, that you know, that's a problem. Try to find some purpose, either get a job you know, volunteer, study, learn, read, do something active. So that's just on a practical level. On a spiritual level, that in of itself has a spiritual impact. And we, we can't disregard being engaged in purposeful activity has a spiritual impact on us. Uh, but also, as you as you mentioned, you know, five things that I always highlight, because this is what I take from, from, from uh, Imam al-Haddad, five things spiritually we should in involve, we should put into our schedule regularly is recitation of Quran, reg like a voluntary salah. Outside of your five daily prayers, we should be praying extra voluntary salah. Um, st learning knowledge. We should all be engaged in some process of learning knowledge. Dhikr of Allah. We should be engaged in some regular, small but consistent practice of doing dhikr. And then lastly, just thinking and contemplating on life, on various things, taking the time to think not always being busy in a stimulated sense. It's okay to be busy in a positive, active sense, but not in a just, I need to be stimulated all the time. So if you are alone, use it in a productive way. Think, read, study, 
dhikr. Those are the things, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Uh, and then, so, another question that we got was, and this has to do more with, like, maybe the mental aspect of it and whether or not this would be feasible. So, we, we discussed earlier how, you know, this, what turns out with maybe just, like, a one or two time thing could end up turning into a very detrimental mental habit. Um, is it possible, do you think, you know, since you worked with YM guys before, guys our age, um, you're also a doctor, do you think um, it's, do you think it's possible to actually just cut off that habit completely? You know, how do you suggest, um, besides everything that we've done, what happens if you're so deep in, you know, what are ways that you can ease yourself off of it if you don't think going cold turkey is even a even an option? So, I'm going to say something that's probably a little bit controversial. I don't know if this is going to be in pu- public. Yeah, it, know. Is, it is. It is. We recorded it and we posted it on the YM Dallas YouTube page. I'm just letting you know. So maybe we'll hold that till offline then. <laughs> I'm going to give the public uh, announcement. Oh, bro. Oh, bro. Uh, I'm going to give you guys an article. I had to find it because I read an article by Sheikh Salman al Auda. May Allah uh, free him and protect him. He's from... Uh, he was one of the great scholars of the Ummah and, and Saudi, but he was arrested in Saudi for a variety of reasons. But anyways, uh, there was something that when I was younger, um, uh, he wrote um, about... Um, uh, hi, hi, hi. Uh, Arafai, Arafai. A lot yeah. of the guys are requesting that you just go ahead and drop... I'm going to call it drop the hook. Go ahead and drop it. We'll just, if you, oh, yeah. we'll just edit it out. Don't worry. Just, just drop it. This is a Zoom exclusive. This is why people register. Go for it. Drop the knowledge, Bob. I can tell you're itching to do it anyways. Okay. That's my edited out, no public, just real with you as your older brother. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes that is what you have to do. But having said that, with any type of addiction or type of compulsive behavior, it is always better to do, um, you know, you can't be like, I'm only going to have one cigarette a day. Like, that's just not going to happen. I only yeah. have one cup of alcohol a day. You have to cut it like cold turkey. That's what they always say. So from that perspective, absolutely. But when it comes to physical release, uh, let's just be real. Brothers, you know, they have the desire at thir- 12, 13 years old. And they're not married till they're 25, 30 years old. Uh, that's just, that's just, you know, I'm not yeah. saying that halal. I'm just saying for some people that may be better than doing something worse. Yeah, so. yeah, that, yeah. I've, I've heard, I've heard that opinion from other scholars as well, where it's like, you know, you got to weigh in what's the greater of the two evils. Um, so yeah, definitely understand. But don't worry, we got you. We'll edit it out. You're all good. No worries. Uh, but um, all right. So another question um, that we have is. What if your temptation is not pornography, but um, easily falling into impure thoughts? You know, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I just want to just gonna touch back on it real quick, where it's just like, you know, how do you fight the urge when those thoughts occupy you? So your addiction isn't necessarily pornography. It's just, you know, just trying to keep those thoughts out. That's why, I, that's why what I just talked about uh-huh. is important to think about as well, because constantly entertaining the thoughts, right, is harmful too. Um, it, it can be harmful as well because that's all you're thinking about all the time. And so, um, and so the best thing is just try to like, again, some of the stuff that we've already talked about, which is keeping yourself as busy as possible, being, you know, try not to be alone as much as possible, try to engage in a regular spiritual practice of salah, Quran, dhikr, fikr, so on and so forth. Like all of these things, like there's no, there's no magical bullet, right? So like, See, I'm a pain physician, right? Uh, one of my specialties is pain management, right? I see patients who deal with chronic pain. And a lot of them are coming to me and they're saying, take my pain away. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't take your pain away because you've been dealing with it for 20 years. But what we can do is we can manage it the best we can. 
And there's no, and I tell them, there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing that's going to make it go away. We're going to try multiple different things and we're going to try a multidisciplinary strategy. That's the term that we use in medicine. I'm going to use multiple different types of strategies to help you with this problem. Similarly, there's no single way to address this problem. And every individual is different. Some people have different life experiences. Some people, let's just be real, have a history of sexual abuse. That's a problem in and of itself that needs to be addressed. Some people have other experiences. And so no, there's no one, one, one size fits all medicine. Like it's, it's something that is taking all of these general advices that I'm sharing with you in these 30 minutes that we have together, 45 minutes we have together, but understanding that you need to seek help if it's becoming a problem for you. Hmm. Inshallah. Okay. Um, well, um, we're coming to the end of our session today, uh, just about getting ready to wrap up. Um, I first want to say Jazakallah Khair to our five for hopping on um, so late on a Sunday night to go and, you know, drop this fire, fire talk for us today. So thank you for that, Jazakallah Khair. Um, and with that, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up for today's talk. Um, Arfai, if you go and do the honors of doing the closing du'a, and then I'll say closing, uh, last few things, and then we'll go and end it. Allahumma fir lana wa rahamna wa hadina wa jibarna wa aafina wa razukna wa rafa'na ya rahma rahimin. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasul alameen. Rabbana aatina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Rabbana iftah lana abu abu rahmatik. Allahumma fir lana wa rahamna wa hadina wa jibarna wa aafina wa razukna wa rafa'na. Allahumma attahir qulubana. Allahumma attahir qulubana min kulli dhan. Allahumma attahir qulubana min kulli shar. Allahumma gfir lana wa rahamna wa anta khair rahimin. Wa Allah give us healing. Wa Allah give us afiyah. Wa Allah give us hidayah. Wa Allah give us tawfiq. Wa Allah give us istiqamah. Wa Allah ta'ala, please wa Allah allow our, 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 our hearts to be firmly established on your deen. Wa Allah protect us and our families and our loved ones. Wa Allah ta'ala guide us. Wa Allah facilitate for us. Wa Allah purify us. Ya Allah ta'ala illuminate our hearts. Illuminate our entire surrounding. Wa Allah make us a source of illumination. وصلى الله مع نبينا محمد وبارك وسلم. All right, perfect. Jazakallah khair. Um, for everyone else watching in today, um, this is a series that we're doing. It's not just a one-time thing. I'm sure you all know because you know I've been spamming you all with emails. Um, just go ahead and stay tuned. We have our next session next Sunday as always. Uh, and go ahead and stay tuned to our social media, any WhatsApp chats that you're in, and we'll go ahead and send you the flyer, the topic, everything, and the question form, just so you guys can go ahead and submit your questions ahead of time. Um, and once again, Dr. Lakhir to RFI, and we'll be, uh, we're good to go. Assalamu alaikum, guys. Assalamu alaikum, Tala. Assalamu alaikum, Tala. All right. Hey, uh